Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? We left. We were trying to take back over. We're doing an autism. From news to talk shows, sports to musicals, our next guest has directed more live network television than anyone else in the business. Don Roy King, a Penn State alum who got his start in television at this public TV station, is currently directing his sixth season of Saturday Night Live. He's also creative director for Broadway Worldwide, a distributor of live theatrical productions. Versatile and cool under fire, King has worked for nine networks on programs ranging from The Mike Douglas Show, The Early Show, and CBS This Morning, to name a few. King's body of work has earned him four Emmy Awards and numerous nominations. We'll talk with him about the adrenaline rush of live television and about his amateur boxing career. Here's our conversation with Don Roy King. Don Roy King, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm thrilled to be here. And it actually started here, not actually in this building, but your television career started in 1969 as a Penn State student uh, working for WPSX-TV. Well, I had just graduated uh, from, from Penn State and uh, was interested in theater. I spent most of my Penn State time acting and I didn't have the guts to move to New York and be a struggling actor and out of nowhere, a guy from the theater department who was doing some production work here said, would you like to come in and be the assistant to my director for a while? We're doing a series called Meaning in Art and some other music series. It was designed for middle school kids. And uh, he was a very inventive guy, great writer, been a playwright at Penn State. And he had designed these shows that uh, were progressive looks at art and music for kids and uh, asked me to come in and just help be a sort of a production assistant. And two weeks after I got here, the director quit, got a job somewhere else and Lou said to me, would you like to uh, take over? He said, at least f work on these two shows we've been working on until we can find somebody else. And I said, I'll give it a shot. And I learned everything I had to know 30 seconds before I had to know it, and I did my best, and he said, okay, the job's yours. And I've been a director ever since. <laughs> and have gone on to become, uh, to have done more live television, more directing than any director today. Well, I think that's true. I mean, arguably so. Uh, I, there's a guy who's done the Today Show for a while. I guess if you added up his hours and compared them to mine, we'd be pretty close. But I directed morning television, two hours a day of live television for 21 years. And you add on to that some other live shows, including one I do now. And I think I probably have been around long enough to be the the record holder in that, in, in, in that world. I want to talk about the, the show you do now, but first I want to backtrack a little bit because you were a broadcast journalism major. Your right. heart, though, was in theater. Correct. And I read somewhere that you didn't have the guts to tell your father that you wanted to be in theater. Yeah, I think he would have said, what? I think you want to be an actor? I said, I get not that he had anything against it. He just thought it was not particularly smart professional choice. And I, while here, was told by many theater professors, as I think most kids are, if you can do anything else, don't do this. And I thought, I sort of resent that because I think there are lots of things I can do. I just made, made a choice that this is uh, a, an art form that I find challenging and stimulating and get the most pleasure from. Why shouldn't I choose it? And uh, I was convinced that I could make it as a professional actor, but I winced a bit when I thought, move to New York, wait on tables, try to scrounge up an agent, go out and sell myself, audition, get rejected, and 
And you were a good actor because I talked with one of the theater professors here who said you were really good and you were in a lot of things at Penn State. Well, uh, that's flattering. Uh, I don't know how good I was, but I certainly did a lot and enjoyed it immensely. And my broadcast major was secondary to my theater interests at the time. And when I graduated, I thought, um, all right, I'll sort of work my way in the back door, be a theater, be it a broadcasting performer of some sort, be a host or an anchor or, or do what you do. And, and uh, just found myself more and more behind the scenes and more and more calling camera shots. And it got me to New York, a place that I could not wait to get to and uh, loved being in. And after there, after being there for a few years and directing at two different stations there, got an offer out of nowhere to move to Philadelphia and direct the Mike Douglas show. Which you did for a year. Uh, a, a couple years, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was big time. And it was live for 90 minutes. So in a way, you cut your teeth on, on live all, only at a different time of day. Here you are now with Saturday Night Live, live at 1130. Right, and I somehow managed to stay awake. Make the transition. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's a great adrenaline rush, and there is a, just a thrill in, in live television that uh, I haven't found matched by anything other than uh, some sports as a kid, and uh, I love it. In fact, you say that directing live television, Saturday Night Live or any of the other programs that you've directed, is like quarterbacking a team. I want to talk about sports for a minute because uh, Don Roy King is your name. You use the Roy, I'm assuming, so that you're not confused Correct. with uh, with Don King, the, the bad hair boxing promoter. <laughs> Correct. Yes. You, you box, though. You're 5'6", and when you were in your, your 30s, you boxed and, and won some amateur titles. I did. I did. I, I'm somewhat what, sheepish to talk about it. I see double as a result. I wear these glasses because I, I took some shots as a 35-year-old over-the-hill uh, boxer. But uh, I also loved it, and I've mount the most challenging physical activity I've ever done. It is the fastest I've ever lived, and uh, love the shape I had to be in and the speed at which that event happens. When I first started, I thought this is some kind of macho related event and discovered it has nothing to do with that at all. It's, in fact, if, if, if you get stirred with anger or uh, any sense of, of, of emotion, it gets in the way. And uh, it's just a very fast, skill-oriented sports. It's a thrill that is deep and long-lasting. <laughs> I guess I find that funny when you look at your resume and you say, because I've talked with a couple of people, and, and that was that's a real thrill that competes with Emmys and, and big things. Well, I, I will not uh, diminish the thrill of winning an Emmy, and I have four of those beautiful statues on display, and I'm very proud of them. However, I also know that I've served on Emmy committees, and I know that they're not nearly as selective as one would hope. I won an Emmy in 1976 for directing The Mike Douglas Show. It happened to be a show that was host uh, that where Mike had convinced Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly to come on the show and reminisce about the old days. And I, when I won that Emmy, I was so full of myself and convinced that I was a boy wonder, and uh, I must have captured the television industry and would be uh, a, a director of renown forever. It was years later that I looked back and I thought, you know something. That show was the one where Mike convinced those two guys to come on and reminisce about old-time Hollywood. And Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly sitting there trading stories. You couldn't miss? Well, it wouldn't have been, it would have been one on Emmy for anybody. All I did was make sure I point the camera at the right person at the right time. It certainly wasn't a sign of brilliant directing. It just was a sign of brilliant uh, 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 casting and, uh, and booking. And Mike convincing those guys to come on. Uh, and then I realized maybe 
I won because of Mike and because of Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, not because of uh, 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 my being a boy wonder. Well, I'm sure there's a little too much modesty in that, but you won your latest Emmy Award when Betty White was hosting Saturday Night Live. That was 2010. That well, was a good show. I, I think I won again this year for um, Justin Timberlake and Lady Gaga. And once again, well, I've got to give much more credit to Betty White and to Justin Timberlake than I'll take for myself because they brought the brilliant writing of Saturday Night Live writers to life and uh, I was smart enough to stay out of the way and capture it properly. But uh, uh, the, those are the people that, that that made those shows work. One of the things you said when you won that Emmy was, had you not been a part of Saturday Night Live, you wouldn't have thought it would be possible to pull off what Saturday Night Live does week after week. It's a machine. It's it, an explain machine. the process of getting an episode of Saturday Night Live on the air. Well, as you suggest, if if I had, if I'd been told six years ago that this is the way was done, I would have said absolutely not. There's no way that a show that is that high pro profile and that important would be thrown together the way this is. But the process is this. Nothing is on paper until Wednesday morning. We meet the host and for about a half hour just throw out ideas to him on a Monday night. And those are just writers throwing rough ideas, mostly to scare the host, I think. They write all day Tuesday and Tuesday night. We come in Wednesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and sit around a big table with a cast and um, a few of us and uh, with the whole rest of the room filled up with other members of the staff as sort of an audience. And we'll read as many as 45 sketches, just script in hand. And uh, that takes hours. And, uh, about 8.30 that night, Lauren Michaels will judge which of those 45 he thinks are worth mounting and narrow it down to 10 or 11 sketches. And for the first time, Wednesday night, I take those sketches into the designers and the set designers and the hair and makeup people and the special effects people and the props people get find out what we're doing for the first time late Wednesday night. So the next two and a half days, it all comes together. And it is an amazing machine, amazing. And I walk in on Saturday, you know, we'll walk into a set that's supposed to be a high school and. Chicago, and I'll say, wow, where, where did that come from? And who painted that wall that way? And who found the, that clock that really looks like a clock that goes, and who, who, who nailed it onto the wall? And, and it's just amazing detailed work. And then we, we do a dress rehearsal at uh, 8 o'clock on Saturday night in front of a, a live audience. And we may go in as much as 30 minutes long, 30 minutes more material than we need. And end that show about 10.15. By 10.30, Lauren has decided to throw out two or three or four of those sketches, reordered the rest of it, and then he'll meet with us to determine all the other details, to share what writing changes has, have been made. Then I'll get my script back at 11 o'clock at night with 150 post-its in it, and I'll turn the page and there'll be a whole new line written here, and the next page, the whole page is crossed out, and, and there's a, a whole new character entrance written in here. and and. I'll say, how are we going to do, do this? Every week I'll say, how are we going to do this? We've never rehearsed it. But he makes those changes based on how the first audience responds. And he's just brilliant at sensing what works and what doesn't. Changes the order of the, of the show. Knows that this will work better after a weekend update. And this kind of material should be right after the monologue and stick in a, the digital short here instead. And rest of it's seriously, seriously edited and somehow gotten to cue cards. And then we go up live at 1130 and fly and it flies. And my guess is you don't come down till three in the morning. It's an adrenaline high and it does, it does drain slowly. I, I, I agree. Although I, uh, I, th that sprint from, from Wednesday to Saturday is pretty intense. So, uh, uh, I can't sleep, but I can't do much else uh, till three. Yeah. My guess is too that uh, 
boxing and being quick on your feet has helped you, served you well as, that, as a director. There, there are definite, <laughs> definite similarities. Uh, <laughs> my face doesn't hurt as much the next morning, but uh, otherwise it's similar kind of dependence on reaction time and, and dealing with it, what gets thrown at you. No, you're the fourth director of Saturday Night Live, and, and in some ways we could say you're the third because the, the second director wasn't there all that long. Um, how do you put your mark on it? And I ask that because uh, Beth McCarthy Miller was kind of known for uh, cutting edge editing, for um, shooting the, the sound or the music stage like a concert, so you felt like you were at a concert. What mark are you, or how do you make it your own? Uh, I, I set my mark almost the second week when I made sure that they put a pencil sharpener in the control room. And I am so proud of that. Is, for some reason, <laughs> Beth works with those mechanical pencils. And I said, no, I'm working with regular number two pencils. And I want a pencil sharpener. And I've got one. <laughs> and I'm very, I'm very proud of that. However, um, I... When, when Lauren first interviewed me, he said, um, how would you shoot music? And I said, uh, I try my best to bring something fresh and, and, and um, bring something new every time. He said, I hate that idea. <laughs> he said. And you wanted this job. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I said, yeah, I changed my mind. That's a, I, that's a terrible idea. I, I, I didn't mean that. That was a joke. Uh, but what he wants is um, the sense that these music acts are appearing on our stage and are part of our look and they are guests of us. And uh, from the beginning, I can remember watching Saturday Night Live and thinking, oh, that's sort of a, the, 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 the music group is in a real place. They're in that real set. And they had a chandelier and had um, paintings on the wall and, and it did have a different feel to it. Now that's, changed, that's been modified over the years, so it's not quite as um, specifically naturalistic as it once was, but the, the, his theory is that it should be seen the way it was designed to be seen in, in a theater, and that most of those groups are staged for concert performances and it should be seen from the best seats in the house, and that means from the front, and relatively straight on, and he was uh, not a big fan of handheld cameras up in the back behind the drummer and reverse shots of, uh, of musicians and doesn't believe in close-ups of hands, and, mm. and he wants a much more traditional, much more conservative approach, and I said, fine with me. Uh, and I understand that and uh, am willing to, have been willing for six years to make that adjustment. And so I would say as brilliant as Beth's stuff is uh, in, in shooting music, mine is much more conservative, but much more in the philosophy of, of Lorne and the approach to the show. His approach to comedy shooting is very similar, that it's much less sharp angles and much fewer directors showing off than it is just provide the Being proper frame and let them do the work within that frame. And uh, I understand that. And, and in, in a way, you've gone full circle because you're now part of uh, Broadway uh, worldwide. Right. And uh, you're taping Broadway musicals right. for pay-per-view. And it, it sounds like something you really are enjoying. Ah, it's, it's a thrill, and it gets me as close to that Broadway magic that I fell in love with as a kid uh, as, as I ever thought I would get. And for those moments, I feel like I am part of that performance, and I am um, part of the magic. I, 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 I love that, yeah. Um, uh, there's a guy who, who thought there was a market for bringing Broadway to the homes or to theaters uh, years ago, and he... Th he was way ahead of his time and uh, managed to, took him six years to manage to convince all the Broadway unions and the Broadway producers that it wouldn't kill their box offices, it wouldn't kill their road shows, and that it might in some way support them. And at first he only managed to get shows that were closing and uh, didn't have big road shows 
plan. Um, but he, his theory has proven to be pretty true. Research shows that uh, it doesn't hurt the box offices and doesn't hurt the, the road shows. And more importantly, he's proven, or we together have proven, that it is possible to capture theater uh, in a way that, that never was well captured before. Plays on television always looked a little bit too broad and the sound was a little echoey and it was, looked a little flat and the lighting was too steep and it never, it never quite felt like you were in the theater. But because of lots of things, including high definition television and jibs and, and steady cams, it's possible, I think, to create a sense of that you are in that theater and that you are in the best seat in the house and sometimes in seats that don't even exist, but you are, you're, 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 you're watching the magic. And the truth is, uh, theater tickets aren't cheap, and so seeing it on television uh, may entice you, probably is, is a better enticer to get you to buy the tickets and go to New York City. Interestingly enough, that seems to be the case, and, and even for the road shows, uh, we thought people would say, well, I saw Memphis on television, let's not see it uh, in the theater, but just the opposite seems to be happening. They say, oh, we saw it, we love that music, let's go see it live. Uh, or they'll say, well, we've got a choice between Memphis, which we saw on television, and something else, which we haven't seen. Let's not, let's not take a risk on that. Let's not spend a lot of money on that. Let's go to Memphis knowing that, that we're, we're definitely going to be entertained. That's the way it seems to work, and, and I hope we get to do more of them. It's just a, it's a, it's a thrill. And, uh, and it's, um, I think it's a valid viewing experience. You said that... Uh Getting this assignment, this plum assignment that is Saturday Night Live directing, was really bringing you closer to your first love. Right. And, uh, right. and I thought it was interesting, too, to read and, and then to see the, the, the trailer. I haven't seen the movie yet. actually tried to rent it. Um, <laughs> you, you got to appear in, uh, as a director, Morning Glory, starring Harrison Ford and, and Rachel McAdams. And, right. Um, but what was that like, playing an actor? Uh, Aside from being, I, being a, I, I mean, playing a director, I'm sorry. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Aside from being a director. I loved it. I had a great time. And we, for, a variety, for a variety of reasons. One was to watch that operation. It was a big time Hollywood movie and they did it right with big budgets and, and uh, it was very slow, meticulous shooting, you know, page by page, line by line, making sure that it, they had everything they wanted, everything they needed. Uh, in fact, uh, it was, she was shot in New York and m many of the crew members were um, um, people who do episodic TV in New York. And they would sit around and grumble. They say, these Hollywood guys, they have all this money there. And, and so they work so slowly. So on on, on uh, Law and Order, we'll shoot 12 pages in a day. And these Hollywood guys will shoot three pages in a day. I said, well, I shoot 150 pages in an hour and a half, so you, you, you won't get any sympathy from me. But it, it is a whole different process and a, and, and a marvelous group of people, and I love being a part of that. I was really hired to be the consultant to make sure that the, what happened in the control room was, was accurate realistic. and realistic. Yeah. But they also asked me to do a little acting, and it's a, I, so I played the director in the control room, and it's a role I've rehearsed for 43 years, so I sort of had it down. Uh, but I, I, I had a great time. What's on your bucket list? You've done so much. I, is there something or someone you'd like to work with? Or? What, what is the opposite of a bucket list? <laughs> what is, what's the things that you've already done that you're happy with? What, what is that call? A uh, list of accomplishments that you're happy with. I don't know. Yeah, there's got to be a better, <laughs> a better I, word for it. Yeah, a bucket list, maybe it should be your, your full, full bucket list. Full bucket, okay. Yeah, but that's not, it's really your, I, at any rate, uh, I've kept track of stuff, and I, I've, I've had a cool life. And I have had an opportunity to do a lot, a lot of things, and I, I have no regrets, and uh, and don't have a burning need to 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 do more. I have every expectation of doing more and taking risks and getting a sh chance to, to do things I never thought I would do, but I, I don't have a burning need to right now. You've said you've been in the right place at the right time, a lot in your life. A lot, yeah, and I, I'm thrilled about that. I'll tell you what I do have, which is by far the best thing that has ever happened to me. I have a 14-year-old daughter. I was going to ask you about her. 
I had no intention of being a father, and when I, suddenly when I was 50, I had this little thing popped out. And I, people, said, people said, oh, it gets better every day. I said, how can it get any better than this? Look, look what I got. <laughs> but it does, and, and I, I love being a father. It's a, by far the, the best job I've ever had. And uh, out of nowhere, she turned out to be a musical theater performer. She's, Cameron, you call her Rune. Wow. How do you know all these things? <laughs> uh, she just was accepted into the High School for the Performing Arts, the, uh, the, the, fame, oh, the fame high school. And she'll start there next year. And, and what's cool about it is it's not so much the spotlight that she uh, loves. It, she loves the process. From the first written word to the strike at the end of the, of the run, she loves the teamwork, the football team that puts on a on a play, and uh, I, I, I could not be more proud and more thrilled to see her grow up. Don Roy King, thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, my pleasure. I had a great time. Thank you, Peg. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Don Roy King. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll find more video from this interview. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. If you've enjoyed Conversations from Penn State and would like to purchase a DVD of this show or any of our other episodes, you can place an order online by visiting us at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.